And we talked to Richland Sheriff and told him they don't like Wolf Hack. So they're looking for him, too. Okay. Thank well, you. you bet. Good morning, this is KFGO. My mom and dad are stranded out there. My mother's a diabetic. I just want them to know if in their car we're thinking about them. I looked to the north and I could see this white wall coming toward me. And I could see it for about two miles in the distance. And I've lived in this area all my life, and I've never seen anything like it. It was just like somebody turned on the blizzard. I mean, it was just like driving into a solid wall of snow. I couldn't describe it. It was just, it was terrible. You know, we've, uh, we've got reports back. Uh, I can remember Pete Lewis called back and said that uh, they found a couple of bodies, and it's pretty tough when you have to uncover them and then relay it to get the ambulance out there. It was, it was tough. Who wouldn't want to go through it again? On Sunday, February 5, 1984, western Minnesota and eastern North Dakota began cleaning up remains of an Alberta clipper. This deadly storm carried wind speeds of 70 miles an hour, delivering wind chill factors as low as minus 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Throughout the Red River Valley, an estimated 800 stranded motorists had to be rescued. Alberta clippers are not uncommon to the Midwestern states that border Canada, but these powerful blizzards are rare. One such storm struck in the 1940s. At that time, Ed Anderson had just joined the police department of Fargo, North Dakota. Later, he would become the city's chief of police. But early in his career, he tasted the power of a killer blizzard. It was time to go to work, and I, I couldn't drive, of course, but I thought I could make it by walking. So I bundled up very warmly and everything, put a scar uh, scarf around my head and everything, and I started out for work. And I got out the front door and tried to go uh, east toward university. And I was out there, I'd, I swear, about 30 to 40 minutes battling my way through the stuff and I thought well I must be somewhere around University Drive by now so I saw a house there so I went up to take a look at where I was in about 40 minutes I'd moved just two houses down the street and visibility was so bad I couldn't tell anything at all I, I must have been even in that little area going in circles going in circles a common description of trying to walk in a real blizzard all human senses are battered. The world becomes like the inside of a bag of flour. All sound is canceled out by the roar of wind. Exposed flesh freezes in an instant. If you get out of your car, then uh, if you try to get to your trunk, we encourage them even to tie a rope or a string to their steering wheel so they can find their way back to their front door. And it, you, this sounds ludicrous. But you, the minute you get out and away, and you, the minute you get 10 or 20 feet from your car during a total whiteout, you can't see your car, and then you're so turned around, you don't even know which direction it is anymore. And when the wind is blowing 50, 60 miles an hour, and, it's, and you have wind chills of 70 and 80 below, you don't have much time for reaction or for pondering or, or wondering what you're going to do next. You've, you've already made a fatal mistake by leaving your car. We in North Dakota are, are used to weather and changeable weather, and we have uh, even, in fact, uh, always carried on our activities regardless of how the weather uh, goes, whether it gets cold or, or windy or snow blowing. Somehow or other, we still get what we want to get done, we get it done. Blizzards are treated differently than other, what we would call emergencies in North Dakota. Because we have blizzards regularly, uh, people can come to be a little bit blasé about them. That attitude puts people like Herb Monson in a bind. 
As head of the National Weather Service in the Fargo, North Dakota and Moorhead, Minnesota area, he's responsible for issuing weather forecasts. The problem is, the area experiences so many snowstorms, his office is constantly giving travel warnings. They become a little complacent. You go for two or three years, and sometimes longer where you don't have one that happens like this, and you come out with a blizzard warning and only last two or three hours, and it's out of the area. And uh, so when you put them out, they say, well, the last two or three blizzard warnings, they only last about three hours or two hours, and, and they disappeared. And so you come out with a blizzard warning. Uh, so lots of times they figure, well, it probably isn't that bad. I can get where I'm going. In a couple hours, I'll be able to go again. So it was on Saturday, February 4th, 1984. At 4.35 a.m., the Weather Service issued a travel advisory warning for the Fargo-Moorhead area, reporting that a storm would arrive by mid-afternoon and that visibility could drop to zero. But the people of North Dakota and Minnesota awoke to a warm, sunny day. We had to come down and um, take family pictures that day. And that was in the morning, and then we kind of scattered. We have seven in our family. We kind of scattered throughout the Fargo-Moorhead area. We woke up in the morning, and a friend of mine called and asked, well, aren't you snowmobiling? Well, I, you know, I'm try to keep you know in touch with the weather in this this uh, area. And I was listening to the radio and they had travelers advisories out. So I told my friend, I said, well, travelers advisories maybe we shouldn't go. And he said, well, if it gets bad, we'll just stay where we're at. Wayne Hendrickson was not alone. All across the region people were driving to hockey games, shopping malls and theaters. I was with Mike Lane Carpet and uh, he, he dropped me off before he went home. And you were home alone? No, I and my daughter Cindy were at West Acres at the mall. Like most people, Ethel and Harold Graff had begun a routine day. One of their daughters, Rebecca Scott, and her husband, Gail, had taken their three children, Brooke, Megan, and Amber, to visit relatives in Fergus Falls, Minnesota, about 50 miles from Fargo. We were just going down for a short trip, so it was just a quickie, and we hadn't listened to any... Uh, really hadn't listened to any uh, weather reports or anything else. I mean, I guess we were listening to the radio, but we hadn't heard anything. And usually I'm, I listen to a lot of radio that way, so I kind of keep track of what's going on. I, it was more or less my fault that we had to leave town because I had a horse that was overdue to have her foal, and she was in an open area, and I was worried about her being it was so cold. I mean, it wasn't a blowy, blister, blustery day. It was cold, but... I wanted to get home. The National Weather Service repeated its travel advisory throughout the morning, predicting a mid-afternoon blizzard. It had been snowing. It was just a real light, quiet snow. Uh, temperature was nice. I, I'm not sure what it was. It might have been in the 20s, even something like that. Uh, as we drove, it's, we got along about uh, 25 miles up towards Barnesville, and it, it started snowing harder, and it was bigger flakes, but they were just, they were just drifting down. Real nice, pretty drive. And uh, halfway between two small communities, my friend Snowmobile's engine blew up. He, he put, a, uh, blew a, put a hole in the piston. So we rode double to the next town. And in that town, we, we met a friend of ours. So we asked him if he'd take his pickup and load up my friend's Snowmobile, which he agreed to do. So I told my friends, I said, being that I'm on the snowmobile, why don't you guys wait about five, ten minutes and then follow me? That'll give me time to get to, to Gary's snowmobile, which they did. So I, when I left Abercrombie, North Dakota, it was a real gentle snowfall. And it's a, just a light breeze. calling an evac unit. One group of people did appreciate the possible seriousness of the National Weather Service storm warning. The membership of EVAC, the Emergency Vehicle Assistance and Communications Group. 
This volunteer organization of four-wheel drive vehicle owners is frequently called upon by the Fargo-Moorhead police to assist in emergencies. Well, we went to condition one about uh, noon or shortly after noon, and we worked from there. Uh, it worsened that uh, we don't have any <laughs> status condition that uh, indicates any worse than that. But our men uh, were able to respond shortly after lunch hour, and, and uh, so we were on full activation by about noon or shortly after. While EVAC members began organizing, most people went about their business as usual. At 3.35 p.m., all that would change. I looked to the north and I could see this white wall coming toward me. And I could see it for about two miles in the distance. And I've lived in this area all my life, and I've never seen anything like it. And my first reaction was try to outrun it, but it over overtook me and in a short period of time. And it was so bad that I could not see the hood of my snowmobile. The weather was just moving into the area, but it came with such velocity and such force. And the wind just picked up so quickly that it was almost an immediate whiteout. Well, we only got about a mile out of town, if even that, before the visibility dropped down to where you could just barely see in front of your car. We thought about turning around and going back. And the problem with that is you can't see if cars are coming, so you don't know, you know, if you turn around, if you're going to get hit in the side or anything. So we just more or less kept going. And it just kept getting worse. Sergeant Donald Caswell of the North Dakota Air National Guard was on duty repairing a broken taxiway light at Fargo's Hector Airport. And in the tend. 10 minutes ago, we were down there, we had an extreme difficult time just getting back to the hangar, which is, what, 600 feet away. Northwest Airlines Flight 62 had just taxied onto the runway when the storm hit. Unable to take off or return to the terminal, the aircraft's 54 passengers would have to wait several hours to be rescued. It was just a night and day difference. We, drove, we were coming along the highway in, this, in a soft falling snow, and when we went under uh, the highway, uh, highway 9 interchange, it was just like somebody turned on the blizzard. I mean, it was just like driving into a solid wall of snow. All of a sudden, the visibility was just dropping just down to nothing. We tried to, we'd already gone past the exit, which was the problem there. We, we couldn't turn around. We, if it would have been... If the timing would have been just minutes any, any other way, we could have pulled off the ex off of two exits at Barnesville, but we'd gone past the last one, and then you've got uh, probably nine miles to the next one. And there was no way you could do anything except just stop and pull off on the shoulder as far as you could and get out of the way in case anybody else was still moving along. 70-year-old Stanley Nygaard and his brother Irwin, aged 49, were suddenly confronted with zero visibility on Interstate 94, just 60 miles west of Fargo. Their car crashed into a truck. Irwin was killed instantly. Stanley would soon be pronounced dead at a hospital in Valley City, North Dakota. As the storm front continued moving southeast, more accidents occurred on I-94. We had I can recall one particular vehicle, a semi. We had a, a, an officer standing on 94, trying to slow people down, out of his vehicle even. And he called me and he said, watch out. He said, a semi just went by me and he didn't see me. The, vis the visibility was that bad. And yet the traffic was still moving. And I was uh, through the intersection or through the underpass, rather, where all these damaged cars were. And I had gotten all the people out, and we had sent them with some other cars into West Fargo. And I didn't see the semi, but I could hear him. And he bounced off four or five of those cars that were damaged already or were stuck in the snow. And uh, that was the end of it. That, that blocked the highway up completely. And we, we then tried to keep cars from coming, but we had a few more that that made it past the officers, and they would just end up coming, smashing into the cars that were there. 
and while the crew was there taking care of the patient, another vehicle came along and, and hit the ambulance, and it wound up being a pile of about 26 to 30 vehicles, if I remember it, before the, everything got settled down and they started closing off some of the highways. Wayne Hendrickson struggled to get to Christine, North Dakota, through the blinding snow. He soon realized, however, that because he couldn't even see beyond his snowmobile hood, he was in danger of colliding with another vehicle. So I stopped it, and I pulled onto a uh, plowed field, because I wanted to get off the highway. And since it was a no coming from the north, I, I got my snowmobile east-west, laid down on the south side of the snowmobile. And at first I panicked. I mean, I was scared. I figured, you know, this is it. I'm stuck out here on a snowmobile. Uh, and it, you worry about your, your survival. Meanwhile, within the Fargo city limits, people were leaving the West Acres shopping mall and returning home. Many drivers elected to take 19th Avenue North a long stretch of newly constructed road that lay flat and unprotected from drifting snow. Wide enough where we couldn't see. The Rebecca Scott's mother, people. Ethel Graff, was shopping at West Acres with her other daughter, Cindy. We looked out and I said, Cindy, we better head for home. So we did, and instead of going through town, we took 29, oh, a minute or two, we got off on 19th Avenue, and we got to the underpass, and there was a, several cars stalled in there, so we stopped. And they were waiting for an ambulance because there was a fellow that was already hurt there. The ambulance did not come. They finally put the fellow in another, it was a Bronco or something, and took him to the hospital because they couldn't wait any longer. At 5 p.m., West Acres Shopping Mall closed early. But many customers who were leaving became stranded in their cars. Over 100 shoppers and store employees decided to wait out the storm inside the building. 23 miles east of Fargo, Moorhead, Gail, Rebecca, Brooke, Megan, and Amber sat helpless in their car on the shoulder of the highway. At first it was, it was still daylight, the sun hadn't set, but as it, the sun started going down, the, the uh, almost like claustrophobia started to set in on you because uh, it didn't really seem so scary sitting there with the wind blowing around you until you realized what it was going to be like after the dark when you couldn't keep the car running. And, uh, it was getting darker all the time. In nearby Oaks, North Dakota, the sudden blizzard trapped 1,000 spectators and athletes who had gathered for a high school wrestling match. Throughout the Red River Valley, hundreds more were stranded at churches, restaurants, and bars. Good evening, this is KFGO. Country radio station KFGO dropped its regular programming and went to the air live with listeners' phone calls. There you are. My wife, Lorraine, and I got separated. She's been trying to call you. You know that? Do you have a number I can get her at? See, we did here uh, a minute ago, but I know she's listening to us. We've asked, she asked us to have you call us here so she could hear you. Okay. So, so you're doing it. You're okay? Yeah, we're in West Fargo, about five miles from Holiday Inn. We can't go any further. Good evening. You're on KFGO. Yes, this is Donna Blotsky calling from Mapleton, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And my husband left work about 3.30 this afternoon, and he's not been arrived home yet. And I'd like to let him know that we've notified the highway patrol and that we're hoping that everything's all right. What time would he have left? Uh, he would have left around 3, 3 or 3.30 this afternoon. Okay, so you're saying stay in the pickup, but Please if Please stay in the pickup, and we've got help looking for you. Okay, but if he's safe, give you a call. Please do. Okay. Wendy Ness, her mother and her brother Dale, had left Moorhead around 4.30 to head back to Wolverton. And an hour later, they were only eight miles out of town. I don't know what side of the ditch we hit. I don't know exactly how we ended up the way we were because we were facing back towards Moorhead when we actually got stuck. And we went in nose first and we were going real slow so it just was the wheel. We just felt the wheel dip in. Looked like it had stalled. The Scott family had been stranded for almost an hour before a truck driver pulled up beside their station wagon and offered them a ride. We had just a scary time even getting into the, the, van, the truck with him because I ran up to the car to, uh, to get Becky and, and the three girls and uh, said, we're going to go with this semi. 
So we jumped out and we each grabbed one of the daughters, one apiece, and carried them over to the truck and had to lift them up into the cab because it was so high. And at the same time, we, we both re realized we might have left the door open and the one, I think it was Brooke, was left in the car by herself. And we realized if she would have stepped out of the car, and just tried to take a few steps. The wind was blowing strong enough, it probably would have knocked her down. And you couldn't see 10, 15 feet at all. So it was just for a second, we were just frozen. I was just frozen, wondering if she was going to be there when I turned around just a few, maybe 10 feet, well, maybe 15, 20 feet to the car to see if she was still going to be sitting there or if she had stepped out. But she was still there, so we grabbed her and threw her up in there, too. We have a stranded uh, vehicle on 19th Avenue. Uh, While busy coordinating the efforts of his uh, evac team, Art Lundy got a phone call from a close friend. Uh, we were called early in the evening by Mr. Royce that, uh, that his son and uh, friends hadn't come home from the theater out by West Acres. And he was quite, kind of concerned. Well, we advised our units, and but we weren't that concerned because Nobody, that nothing serious had really happened on 19th Avenue before. Ethel Graff and her daughter Cindy were still trying to get out of 19th and Avenue North. Had left. There were four or five vehicles still sitting there, so a pickup, a four-wheel drive pickup, led the rest of us out across 19th Avenue until we got into town. And you couldn't see any. In fact, that pickup that was leading us, we saw it part of the time, and part of the time you just hoped we were behind. Meanwhile, Wayne Hendrickson was stranded alone with his snowmobile in a farmer's open field. And I knew if I covered myself up immediately and could serve all the body, body heat I had, that I probably could make it. And most of the time, these, these storms, when they come up, only last four or five hours. And I said, I know I can last four or five hours. I was dressed real well. I had a, a snowmobile suit, uh, all the, the winter clothing. I had a helmet, goggles, and a full face mask. So I covered myself with snow up to my neck, immediately. Yeah, a drive Ethel Graff and her daughter Cindy made it home safely. However, the Scots had not yet returned from Fergus Falls. Soon, Ethel and Harold realized that their daughter's family was probably trapped in the storm. And now they faced a serious dilemma. Wait the storm out and hope for the safety of their loved ones, or risk their own lives and try to rescue them. We'd talked it over and we were gonna go early, but we were listening to the re weather report and they kept saying, don't go out, you know, and, and then it's gonna let up around midnight. And well, we thought, you know, they, maybe they'd be all right up until midnight. Unknown to them, sure the Scots were by this time huddled together in a tractor trailer, really struggling to get to a truck stop uh, 11 report. miles away. He managed to keep his uh, semi running. We were kind of worried about that because the temperature was dropping all the time, too, so that, uh, we didn't know if his fuel was going to gel up on him or if he was going to have trouble that way. But he kept it running, even though with it on high idle, he couldn't get any heat out of it. The engine was, was cooling down that fast, even on high idle, that he could barely keep his windshield, um, the bottom of it, de uh, defrosted. Meanwhile, on Minnesota Highway 75, the Ness family waited in their car for help. And I was so worried about this horse that was at home, and I was feeling guilty for dragging my mom and my little brother out with me. And um, a lot goes through your mind when, when you get stuck like that. We were lucky we had a lot of blankets along. We just picked up groceries, so we had some food, although the food got froze within you know, not so long. Volunteers with four-wheel drive vehicles were scouring highways and roads for the stranded. If you didn't have four-wheel drive, you didn't have any business out in that blizzard because it was soon impassable roads, and even with four-wheel drive vehicles. And we always went in caravans. No one vehicle went alone. At least two would go together. Because uh, you could, if you got stuck out somewhere and you tried to uh, walk for help, you, uh, you could last maybe 10 minutes at the most outside of your car. This is KFGO. 
this is Eugene Ness from Wolverton. Yes. Yeah, my wife, Doris, and my daughter, Wendy, and my son, Dale, left Moorhead at about 4.30 on Highway 75 going south to Wolverton. Mm -hmm. And we haven't heard from them since. Okay, they left at about 4.30. Yeah. All right. If anybody send that, we'd appreciate it if they'd, they'd call you or us. Well, we were listening to the radio, and they were saying they didn't know when the storm would let up. So we had no idea how long it would be. We figured we were there till morning. It was late in the evening and the icy storm still raged. Rescuers were amazed to find motorists dressed as though it were a spring day. Many of them improperly dressed. Light shirts, uh, light jacket, tennis shoes. So if one did walk, they wouldn't make it 30 or 40 feet. We couldn't, we had to start screening the calls. We couldn't take all the calls. We, we, there was a lot of people that needed help, we couldn't help. Midnight approached, and the blowing snow continued. I was uh, sitting on top of my snowmobile, and I was pounding my foot into the ground just to, you know, keep the circulation going. And all of a sudden, my, my right heel hurt when I started pounding in. I said, well, this didn't hurt before. Something's wrong. So I took my glove off to feel my boot, hear my boot had come off. And all I had on then was my inner lining of the boot. And I couldn't see anything. I could not see the sled. So at all times, I kept one foot on the sled. So I said, well, you know, where am I going to find this boot? So I crawled on my hands and knees with one foot in contact with the snowmobile at all times. Luck would have it, I found the boot. And then I had to take my, uh, my glove off to get it on. My hand froze instantly, and my, my fingertips were like rock. I, I, I tried to look, lace and well, zip my boot and lace it up, and I couldn't. I mean, I couldn't. So I just said, the heck with it, I just left it the way it was. So all night long, it was exercise, sit down, exercise, sit down. I kept telling myself, don't fall asleep, because if you fall asleep, you're going to die. I knew I was going to die. By midnight, the Graffs had heard nothing about their daughter and her family. So Harold Graff and his sons, Mike and Dan, loaded their four-wheel drive pickup with supplies, dressed for the worst weather conditions, and set out on a rescue mission. My brother had to have his head out the window to see the, you're looking at the white line and I was looking at the center line, the skips, and my father was looking at the other white line and that's how we drove off there and, it's, you know, you couldn't see, just once in a while you could see a line here and there and that's how, how we got out there. I stopped at the scene of a, a car where there were a couple of people in the median and there were, as I pulled up on the left side of the highway, I noticed there was a car off to my right sitting over on the other edge of the road. And I didn't notice anyone in it at first. But the two that were in the car then got out and I got them in my car and I heard a pounding on the window and, and I opened the door and there was a young lady. She was just absolutely terrified didn't know where she was at, didn't have any idea that she was, she thought she was going to die. And she got in the car, and of course she was half froze. She got in the car and she sat there and she cried for about half an hour. Didn't I didn't even try to talk to her because she just absolutely couldn't talk. She cried for about a half an hour until she got warmed up. The graphs, Harold, Dan, and Mike, could only guess which roads the Scott family had taken. As their search continued, they encountered other stranded motorists. There was two guys we came by, and they were, they had sleeping bags and stuff, and we offered to give them a ride, but the only thing we had was the back of the pickup, and they said, no, we'll stay in the car because it's a lot warmer here. So they didn't go with us, but when we came up to those little girls and that lady, they were just ecstatic to get a ride and stuff because it was like an ice box in their car and some of them couldn't even feel their feet, the little girls. And they were dressed for a birthday party and and they were, when you looked at them, they're just like, they couldn't make any facial expressions because they were so cold and they're just like they were in shock and in pain. How long do you think they've been stranded? 
they they had been stranded in their car at least six or seven hours before we found them. I think we found them at two o'clock. And you had to get out of it. It just looked like it had been stalled. Even though safe in the cab of a truck, the Scots were facing their own problems. Well, it wasn't easy. Um, we didn't have, you know, any cups or anything, or, you know, we didn't know what we were going to do. You couldn't open the door and go outside. And um, thankfully, the truck driver had finished his coffee and had his little plastic stop-and-go cup, and he let us use that. And, I mean, there was there was no such thing as privacy, really. I mean, we had to take the kids and, and um, kind of be right next to them in the front seat. And... Uh, the kids didn't want to have to use a little cup to go to the bathroom, but it was necessary. And so finally, after some crying and, you know, procrastinating, they realized it was this or nothing. And, you know, so I, they'd use the cup and I'd have to hand it to the driver. And then he'd have to try and open the door a little bit and empty it out on the ground. And we had to go through that quite a few times during the night. By 4 a.m., the Grafts had rescued about 20 people. But the driving was hard and slow, and they had not brought along extra gasoline. After traveling only 20 miles, their fuel was gone. And the final irony was that the Scott family had never even been on Highway 52. They had picked another route back to Moorhead. Out of gas and on the wrong road, Harold, Dan, and Mike would not be able to find the other members of their family. However, no one was more alone than Wayne Hendrickson. My friend that I was snowmobiling with told the rest of the people that he was going back out in a four-wheel drive pickup and looking to look for me. And they told him that that was, you know, foolish, that you cannot see. Four-wheel drive uh, vehicles are, are no good if you don't, you can't have a visibility. So they had to, what I've heard, physically restrain him from leaving uh, his place of safety. Also, what, what I thought in my mind is I didn't expect anybody to come. I did not keep looking for people to come and rescue me because I realized that they couldn't. So that wasn't even in my realm of hope. Sports bar, huh? In the early morning hours of Sunday, February 5th, Fargo's 19th Avenue North resembled an Arctic landscape. More than 15 vehicles were solidly encased in four to six foot drifts. And the street was inaccessible. It was, it was no way we could travel in it. It, it took snow plows. Meanwhile, 21 miles southeast of Fargo, Harold, Dan, and Mike Graff found themselves as helpless as the people they had been trying to rescue. Mike and Dan then decided to leave their pickup and walk to the nearest farmhouse for gasoline. Many who have attempted such a journey in a raging blizzard have not survived. So then my brother Dan and I, we went and walked to all, we left my dad in the pickup and we walked, started walking to Marsville and we saw this light way across there. Every once in a while you could see the light of this house. We walked over there in there was music going on in there and the lights were all on but nobody answered the door when we knocked and we knocked for about five minutes we went to two or three other places yeah. and knocked and it was like either they weren't there or they just wouldn't answer the door and then so. we walked into barnville good morning this is kfgo yes this is mrs harold graff i live in north fargo and we have been looking for our son and daughter-in-law and their three children they left uh forget yes at four o'clock in the afternoon and we haven't heard from them yet but uh, my husband and two sons are, are out looking for them now, and they did get to Barnesville. Harold Graff waited in the pickup for his sons to return. I tried to sleep, and uh, I kept looking to, through the windshield a little bit, see if I could see him coming back, and, and I prayed, and, uh, and uh, I shook. You know, I got cold once in a while, because, as like I said, the snow was, was covered me, and, you know, all over, even though I had the sleeping bag around me. So we just kind of made the best of it. We bundled up with blankets and we'd stuff newspapers and whatever we could into the cracks and keep the cold out. My gas line froze up so we couldn't start the car up intermittently either. So it was more or less, you know, we had to keep warm with just the body heat. And we didn't really do a lot of moving because we had blankets and we had 
extra coats and stuff along and it seemed to be smarter to just sit there and conserve the warmth rather than moving around and letting the cold get in underneath the covers and stuff. By 4.30 a.m., snow plows were finally making headway on Fargo's 19th Avenue North. The wind had packed that snow just uh, solid as ice almost. It was a, uh, it's a situation that you don't run into all the time, but in this case, the wind just packed that snow, and, and it was quite a chore to even get to the vehicles and get, uh, get the passengers out of the vehicles. We had one individual by the name of Pete Lewis. Uh, went up to a car and uh, uh, he thought it was empty but then uh, if, I, if I recall he said he's gonna make one more quick look in there and he did make one more quick look and got the I think I don't know if he broke the window or got the door open partially and still was under the impression that the car was empty but it wasn't empty and he did find uh, if I remember a small small child in the back it was uh, still alive, and, and the mother and father were, I, I believe, in the front. They were both unconscious, but they were all made it well. And it was just, it was almost a, well, the car is so empty. It, it looks empty. It is empty. But I want to look one more time, and it was a, a good luck. But some rescues were not as successful. I'd been here since Saturday mid-afternoon, and this by this time this was uh, Sunday morning, 05 a.m. or so. And I remember when uh, Colonel Haig called me, and he says, uh, "I got some bad news." And I said, uh, "Do I want to hear it?" He says, "Probably not." Paul Jurgens, you, you have some late word. Uh, we have a bit of uh, tragic news here, uh, Bill. Uh, we have a. Uh, Confirmation, I guess, uh, that uh, three people have been found dead in a vehicle on 19th Avenue North in Fargo. Uh, the cause of the death is not known. Uh, further details are not immediately available uh, at this time. Uh, once again, uh, confirmation that three people have been found dead in a vehicle on 19th Avenue North in Fargo, west of uh, University Drive. Art Lundy knew that his neighbor's son was stranded in a car on 19th Avenue North. You know, when I called Mr. Royce and I uh, asked him, uh, I said, I suppose the boys got home safely. And he said, no. Shortly after the initial report, it was announced that four people, not three, had died of carbon monoxide poisoning after their vehicle got stranded on 19th Avenue North in Fargo. 50-year-old Robert Hughes, his son, 13-year-old Bradley Hughes, 14-year-old Dean Stansfield, and 13-year-old Charles Royce. Near Fredonia, North Dakota, 64-year-old Arnold Fuchs was found dead beside a fence. Apparently, he had been trying to follow the fence to his home, only a half mile away. Around 7 a.m., the winds began to subside. So I started walking. When I started walking, my legs were numb, and I'd fall down, and I'd, I'd crawl for about 10 yards. I'd get up and I'd walk again. And I did that for a mile, and I got to this farmyard. And the first building I came to was an old corn crib. And my reaction was crawl into that corn crib, but I said, well, gee, there's the house. So I continued on, and I got to the farmhouse. I knocked on the door, and there was no answer. And my immediate thought was, I'm going to kick the door down, because I, I knew I had to get in. I, I really was feeling, you know, at the end of my rope, physically and mentally. And something before, just when I was getting ready to, to kick the door in, I turned the doorknob and it wasn't locked. I walked in, I heard some kids playing. So I, I said, oh, my, name, Wayne, oh, my name is Wayne Hendrickson. I've been out in the snowstorm on a snowmobile. I need help. And the lady of the house came around the corner and saw me, and her first reaction was, oh, my God. I, you know, I was really a sight to behold. My, my suit was uh, hard as rock, you know, and uh, frost. I was also all covered with frost. 
Harold Graff had been waiting alone in his pickup since 4.30 a.m. for his sons to return with gasoline. Uh, about 7 in the morning, I heard something on the road, and I looked out, uh, opened the door and looked out, and here was a rescue. And then they took us into Barnesville, and when I, we come driving in, I saw the boys that they were okay. Meanwhile, the Scott family finally reached T.J.'s truck stop an 11-mile trip that had yeah, taken 12 hours. Off the, uh, the exit and entrance, entrance ramps were pretty much blown shut. He had, to, he had to actually go under the, go past the exit ramp and then back the semi up the entrance ramp because that was open. And uh, he was doing some pretty, pretty good driving and it's kind of a problem because he didn't have any weight in his trailer. So he was, he was doing some fancy stuff to get us back up in there. Once we got to the truck stop, it was just, he couldn't even get near the truck stop because of all the other semis that were parked all over the place on the road and in the lot. I always think about, you know, the hard time it was just even getting in there. I mean, they had to park so far away, and then each of us had to carry one of the kids, and I didn't think I'd make it. So by the time we got there, the sun was up and the wind was going down. Wendy Ness and her mother and brother also eventually were rescued. Well, my horse, I got home and she was fine. <laughs> She'd had the baby and all my horses had about two inches of snow on their backs except the baby which was running around and didn't have a care in the world. I came into the house laughing and crying because I couldn't believe it. Um, the way the storm was and everything was fine, it was, it was like a miracle. Wayne Hendrickson suffered severe frostbite of his lower back, wrists, and neck. He also had lost 10 pounds during his 16-hour ordeal in the open field. Alone in a raging blizzard, the odds had been against him. I have a wife and three children, and I, I wanted to live. And I think I had, had uh, faith in my ability. And I told myself that if I want to, I can live, and I, and I did. The blizzard was over. 22 people in North Dakota and Minnesota had lost their lives in the storm. The new morning sky looked as clear as it had only 24 hours before. People were able to venture outside to dig out their cars or help others. Except for the sound of the snow plows making their way through the streets and highways, it was a quiet morning, a time for reflection. I remember very distinctly uh, the next morning helping my son with his paper route. We were wading through the snow and I encountered some people on the paper route who said that uh, the people had died uh, and this was of course only a half a mile from my house and, and it turned out of course they were the children in the uh, fatality were friends of my own son so we felt very close to the whole event. Uh, feel badly about it yet to this day. Since this devastating blizzard, Fargo and Moorhead City streets prone to heavy drifting are now barricaded during snowstorms. However, these barricades can only act as a symbolic gesture to warn people of danger. There are those, however, that uh, when you reach a point where it's hazardous and we try to tell the people that uh, there's an advisory out, we advise no travel, there are some people that still feel that they can get through. And they will try. In uh, recent blizzards we've been having in the last uh, few weeks, uh, there's been a lot of problems with this, uh, putting up barricades so, uh, to tell the people not to drive there, and they deliberately go around the barricades, feeling that they can get through. And uh, then, of course, if they do get through, fine, but if they don't get through, either they're going to be uh, in serious trouble or we're going to have to go and get them. It isn't that we have any ill will against them or anything like that, but we sometimes wonder 
what happens when we put out our warnings, uh, whether they heed them, why they don't heed them, is uh, really something to, that we don't understand. Yeah, I was asked by different ones if I'd do it again, and I would. I'd go out again looking for people, you know, because it's an awful thing to be left out there in a storm and no heat or nothing. The people of the Red River Valley experience many snowstorms. And blizzards are certainly not uncommon to them. They're a fact of life. Most winter storms are hardly worth remembering. But the blizzard of February 4th, 1984, will always be etched upon the memories of those who survived it. After I recovered, which was about a month later, I drove out there with my friend, the guy that I was out selling with. We went for a drive out in that area. I mean, I could almost relive that whole experience. And, you know, I went step by step from the time I left Abercrombie to the point where I stopped my snowmobile and I looked across the field and I could see the farmer's house and realizing now that that was a mile away and, and thinking to myself how long it took me to get there and then I you know I had to crawl and stumble and drag myself that full mile it, it was I was amazed amazed that I survived looking at the situation I, I to this day I'm, I'm amazed that I was able to to, to make it The American Red Cross recommends that motorists carry a survival kit when driving in winter. The kit should contain a number of items to help ensure the safety of drivers and their passengers during an emergency. For a free copy of the pamphlet, Winter Survival in Your Car, write to American Red Cross, Minn Kota Chapter, 1100 3rd Avenue South, Fargo, North Dakota, 58103, or call anytime, 701-232-8951.